It's a bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I'm a bird nerd. This is a tech edition of the bird emergency. For those of you who uh, listen frequently, you'll know that I'm often raging about companies and bureaucracies and uh, the corporate evil. People not doing what they can to be better. So I checked out a little thing called Green KPI. And the founder of Green KPI, Joanna Clute, is with us today. And Joanna is joining us from the rainforest. So they're genuine bird noises in the background that I have not had to add in post-production. Hi, Joanna. How are you? Hi, Grant. I'm fine. It's a pleasure to be with you today. It's a pretty fantastic um, backdrop and back background you've got there. Just let everyone know approximately where you are. I'm in a beautiful place. It's been my home for the last 21 years called Bramston Beach. It's a hamlet by the ocean. It's about an hour south of Cairns. And uh, I've had the absolute privilege of uh, moving here 21 years ago to a pretty messy 100 acres full of weeds and, and uh, just lots and lots of issues. So I made it my project for the last 21 years to remove the noxious weeds by hand, no poisons. There's been no poison on that farm for 21 years. And uh, grow uh, mostly native, Australian native fruit trees and some exotics, and uh, but not much. It's mostly about the natives. And uh, so whenever I would remove a whole, there were homogenous areas of, of um, introduced weeds. So when I took them out by hand, um, I would then replace that area with um, with regenerative uh, native trees, but fruit trees, because you know we, we need food security. Food security is going to be a major issue. And having plants that are born to live in the area have got a much better chance of survival than the exotics that we've brought in. Well, that raises two questions, and it's really off topic of what we were going to talk about. But it's right up the uh, up the avenue of the bonus issue uh, episode that I released today, which was about mm. selecting plants for a wildlife friendly garden. And Joanna, you probably aren't aware I'm a horticulturist by <laughs> by training, and indigenous plants is something I'm really um, passionate about. Um, Oh wow, we're we're getting oh my we're getting passion comments. We're getting comments, yeah. so I'm just I'm just letting you letting you know I will try and um, uh, wow. Can I share my story about how I fell in love with indigenous plants? Uh, you can. I'll just say that there's someone wokiest on uh, on Twitch has said hello, Joanna, and uh, Silk Row is saying answer me. I have bird questions. Well, put your bird questions, and when we have time, we will talk about them. But we are actually going to talk about Joanna's thing to start with. So, um, yeah, there we are. It's good. It's great that people are joining in. That's what we're. That's what we do it live for. Um, mm. Joanna, tell us. <laughs> well, uh, I um, I started learning to fly when I was eighteen years old, and uh, so I became a uh, commercial pilot. And uh, I was flying out of Arnhem Land as a, as a new pilot for a while. I was living in Managrita for uh, just under two years, where I really came to understand Indigenous culture and, 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 and food. And uh, also there were times I'd be out at outstations where I would meet Indigenous people who were living absolutely off the land. No, no, um, no white input, let's call it. No um, non, non-Indigenous input. So um, I was able to see people living in such a way that the forest around them was their hardware, it was their pharmacy, and it was their supermarket. And so at one stage I was just uh, with a, gr a group of men and they all disappeared into the bush. And when they came back, they had arms full of food. What I saw was trees. What they saw was food. And that made me realise that there was a real connection time for me to really understand our relationship with the environment. Our relationship is not with the economy. The economy is purely a conduit of supplying what the environment produces to us as well, the, people who the consume. The economy is just a function of a society. That's all it is. It doesn't it's exist certainly, without a society. So. It's a human-made. Yeah. Mm, indeed. So... Um, 
the, let, let's talk about your your block before we get into green cat mm. di when you were removing the noxious weeds and then replacing um the those plants with shall we say useful functional um, fruit bearing plants did did you did you hunt out uh where possible indigenous plants or were you really limited by sort of the rainforest plants that were available commercially because that's a real issue with replacing plants when you were working in a in, in a bushland setting yeah yeah that's right i started off by uh, using a local nursery up on the tablelands you grew a nursery um, but then as I became more established and my, my you know, network grew and also was able to start propagating because I, I forgot to mention that um, I wasn't living alone. I was living with a colony, almost colony, but a, with a lot of um, uh, cassowaries. And the cassowaries okay. leave beautiful piles of processed seed for me to plant. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I actually have a nursery. And uh, so um, I uh, yeah propagate plants and put them back in the ground. Oh, well, that's a whole other thing that we can talk about for a later date. I'm really interested in in how successful you can be propagating uh, native plants from, you know, wild source seed. Um, not enough people are doing it, but, yeah, we can, we can talk about that a, 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 on a later date. But what we're here to talk about today is an initiative that you've put together, which is called Green KPI, which is a is it standalone software um, that helps businesses to track their their inputs and their sustainability. I think that that's the briefest way to describe it. But mm. how, how do mm. you describe Green KPI? The very first word I use well before tracking, the very first word and the intent of the company is to drive change with action. So action is the number one word. This is the word that everybody is screaming for, action on sustainability, action on climate change, action on social equity. And that's what Green KPI does first. So we have hundreds of actions from the simplest, smallest behavioural action to your larger, you know, more expensive, more complicated action that we list. And what the way it works is that uh, we usually have like a team of maybe five people and they uh, assign actions to each other. So therefore, it's documented. It's an assigned task. Like, you know, you've got lots of uh, software out there that, that are project management software. This is... a a version of that for sustainability. So the task is assigned or the action is assigned and it's got enough information with there to say, this is what you do. And it could be something as simple as managing refrigerator, make sure there's a space around the fridge, make sure the fridge can breathe, make sure the fridge um, compressor is cleaned every six months or you know, whatever the tasks are about uh, not leaving fridges empty, putting empty milk bottles in there or something just to make it cheaper to run. There's a lot of things people can do just to make a fridge a lot cheaper to run, therefore using far less um, energy, therefore far less emissions. It's not that hard, but if you don't know, it's impossible. So that's what Green KPI does. And we've, at the moment, we have about 400 actions across energy, water, waste and materials. And it's based on the Global Reporting Initiative. So our aim is to get to 18 actions across environment, social and economic actions that people can take. And then by doing the actions, we will see their impacts reduce. Then we measure that reduction in impact through the tracking mechanism. And instead of taking guesses at, well, we burnt this much and we burnt that much, therefore our emissions is this and it might be that, we take it directly from invoices. So the information that comes from an invoice is input into the system and that can then be turned into a chart, a graph, a very easy to understand item. The way that we show that is by producing automated, infographic rich sustainability reports in the form of a dashboard. So let's say uh, you have a company and your company is um, you know, birdemergency.com.au and you want to show that you're operating at a, um, at sustainably. Instead of just putting a, a tab on your website that says sustainability, someone opens that tab and says, we are, uh, we are a responsible company. We, um, yeah. we, we donate care. to the local. Yeah, we care. We take we it care. seriously. 
Yeah. And we donate to the local football club. So we're great. The um, what, what they will see instead if they're uh, with Green KPI is we'll open up a dashboard. And on that dashboard will be interactive panels where you can see the rate of change or, or the actual. It's up to the company if you want to show rate of change or actual, but how much the company's actually been using. And also every single action that has been completed. So when the action is assigned to a staff member and the staff member completes that action, that instantly adds onto that sustainability report. So it's a live sustainability report. It's a live dashboard on the company's sustainability. So that means that there's no. it's much more difficult to greenwash because people are able to see exactly what the company has been doing and that should match the reduction in impact that should be shown. Um, it can be a little bit tricky. If you've got a company that's, say, growing 20 to 50%, of course they're going to use more. So we incorporate what's called a production factor. So if a or a production unit. So that means, say, if you're and you choose. So let's say the company is growing, and the measurement of growth is the number of widgets it makes, or the number of employees it employs. We factor that into it as well to show that yes, the company might be growing and using more, but its net consumption is actually reduced. We want to show that companies are reducing their impact, and it's. And so we need to bring in those ratios as well. It's, um, it all comes from the fact that in 2011, my dear brother had a baby. And I met that child at two days old. And I realized that this kid was not going to have the same opportunities that I had. And because the world was just not going to be the same world. There's going to be far more uh, there, there were going to be far more problems than, than what I had purely because the environment can no longer produce at the rate it needs to compared to the amount of consumption that we are consuming. So, you know, it's mathematics. It's like taking more money out of your bank account than what interest is producing. And so I right there and then decided I was going to do something about it. And the next thing I was doing a degree in sustainability with a business major at university. And I chose a business major because I can see the governments were not doing anything. They were hamstrung by, well, let's, let's call it donations. And, um, and society, they wanted to buy, even if they did want to buy, uh, sustainable products and services. It just wasn't available if or, businesses or you didn't clue on to it. Them. That's, the, that's, that's right. The that's thing. right. Yeah. And so I wanted to fill that gap where uh, where businesses who want to transition, because they do want to, but they don't know how. And the only options they've got is to spend $150 an hour on a sustainability consultant like me, um, or they can hire, they can put their staff through schooling um, or use that software that's really quite expensive and all it does is measure and, and report, where what I wanted to do is to create something that was democratic for all size businesses. So I created something that's based on teams. So if you're the cafe across the road, you have one team of up to say of you know up to five people. You can work with Green KPI, and you'll be able to um, assign your actions, track your inputs, and automate those reports, all for forty-seven dollars a month. If you're can Starbucks I- and you've got thirty-three thousand stores around the world, that's thirty-three thousand times teams. So it it expands with the size of the company. One thing that I've always been sceptical about, and uh, I started out a few years ago trying to um, offset every everything I, I was doing that wasn't like taking public transport and, you know, regular listeners and viewers know that I got rid of a car, my car in 2014. So I've been, what are we now, six, eight eight years with with no car and all that kind of stuff and for a while it felt good but it gets really frustrating when you see that the the businesses and the the entities in our society that can make the biggest difference are the ones that we are forced to use so in in green kpi Do you have some sort of metrics or some kind of system to measure the things that every company needs to use, i.e. a bank or a a financial institution, the superannuation fund? Now, some of them are far from 
environment friendly or sustainable and some mm. are much better. Mm. So, so, mm. but if you're a company, you've got to be involved in the superannuation system and you've got to have banking. So, mm. so how, there, there are many how things do you deal with that? that? Yeah, yeah. There are many things that a company has to do to be to, to stay in business. So there's a lot of uh, services and products that a company uses. So we have a system where, um, in as part of the actions, so we so let's say banking. We might uh, as an action, we might say we we don't at the moment because we haven't engaged the supply. But you might have an action that says um, ensure that your that you know the banking institution that you uses that you use or that you use. Um, are sustainable and um, and you can check these uh, parameters out to make sure that they are actually sustainable and not greenwashing. Uh, but also what we do is that if we have engaged with a company, a supplier, whether it's banking or printer cartridges or sunscreen, that is a sustainable company, that is providing a sustainable product or more sustainable than, than the rest of the, the crowd, uh, we will list them as a supplier. So that way you've got the opportunity of looking at who's available that does supply, uh, that does provide a, um, a sustainable option. So have you got some financial institutions No, No, not at the no. moment. They, if, so if, if I did, uh, in Australia, um, I guess Australia Bank would have to be on, on top of that list. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if you're a, a friendly Geordie, Geordie's fan, but <laughs> yeah. he's been... Uh, he, He's been quite a bit of a maverick in mm. criticising the, the the institutions that are not um, particularly koala friendly. That's really his uh, mm. his yeah. thing. And I was mm. surprised how few of our major financial institutions take biodiversity and sustainability seriously. But that's that's a whole yeah. that's a whole other episode and could get us into all sorts of legal trouble if, yeah, that, that's, if we go that's naming right. them. But yeah, uh, let's talk. Briefly about greenwashing. Um, mm. How do you define greenwashing? And are there any really well-known examples of greenwashing in in our Australian everyday life? Well, I, obviously, I'm not going to go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, it's um, it really once you know what to look for. It's uh, it, it, words are powerful, and marketers are brilliant. And so, if you read something and, and you and you can't see any actual action, so uh, I went into a major what shall we call it? A major supplier of stationery, and um, and I said, "Can you do you have a sustainability officer?" Uh, don't know. Uh, do you have any sustainability um, procedures that you follow here? Um, look, you'll have to talk to head office. And this is an, a national company. So that meant that the people working on the floor had absolutely no leadership, no idea. Now, I think things have definitely changed with that particular chain. This is going you know, back a bit when I was doing my research. But I would walk into many of these places, especially the larger stores, um, and people would have no idea, and it's oh, you'd have to ask head office about that. And that is one of the biggest problems with sustainability. It sits in head office. It really needs to sit at the shop floor because guess who's got the best ideas about bringing sustainability into a shop or a business of any type? The people who have to the, fill up the, the bins outside. The people working on it. That's yep. Exactly right. And that's one of the things in Green KPI that I'm really pushing. We've got a section... That is, um, it's called custom uh, actions, and that means, let's say, uh, Aldi is a customer, and you've got, you know, you've got like maybe a 16-year-old shelf stacker who comes up with a fantastic idea about how they can uh, become more sustainable, because that is where the ideas come from. It's from the people who are actually working the business, not the people who are managing the business. And so that person can then manage up to the manager and say, I've got this idea. Can we trial it out? They can trial it out in the store. And if it works out to be really good, that can go across, because of the software across every single store, perhaps in the world, that can improve sustainability for that store. And, it, uh, and, that's, um, th and that's a very important part of sustainability is to have that managing up. The managing down is in the form of support from 
uh, leadership and management and the managing up is that practical understanding of how to operate a business better. How often, how many times have you worked for a company and you've sat around the smoko room and talked about, oh, look, if they would only do this or if they do that, but no one will listen to me. If there's a lot of people I'm sure be going, yeah, yeah, I've, I've been in that situation. Imagine if the whole world started to listen to the employees and took action. Imagine that. What what a world we would live in. Mm. Um, <laughs> oh, I've worked for some of the, the largest companies in Australia and I'm surprised at how far we haven't come in, in 20 years. Um, I recently did a mail out to 120 local government bodies and I, I just asked one question, and that was, do you have a biodiversity policy? Guess how many replies I got? Zero. Zero. And on following up, and I'm up to about 50, guess how many councils I found with a biodiversity policy? The same. Zero. That's right. But they all have motherhood statements as mm. part of their mission statements yeah. where they're including things like the environment and, and whatnot. So how how do we where, – where do you think the biggest gains are? For a country like Australia, we're in the um, mm. G20, one of the top 20 economies in the world. Um, where do you think the easy gets are for a – a country like Australia in sustainability and if we def would define sustainability in resource usage because I want to mm. lead you towards the circular economy. Yeah, yeah, please do. I um, And the, the, this, my frustration is, is every time we have big questions, we think it's big answers. We think that it's the macro that is the solution. It's It's... 8 billion micros, that is the solution. It's the way we buy things. Every single cent or peso or pound or euro that we spend is a vote for biodiversity. So when we come to understand where stuff comes from and where it goes and the impact, not just on biodiversity, but also the, the, the um, waste management and, and what that's doing to um, to people, to third world countries, all sorts of things. But let's just stay with biodiversity here that we could go forever. Um, when we understand the biodiversity impact of every single cent we spend and we start spending in such a way with that knowledge of, okay, this sunscreen that I'm going to use today, what impact does it have when it washes off my body? What's going to happen with the container when I put it into either the recycling or not the recycling. What's going to happen? Where, where did it come from? What was used to create this? What are the, what's the, what's the, the uh, life cycle of this thing? And I think when, when we, and it's not that hard to think about it when you've just got a very basic understanding, when you start asking yourself the question, and when you start asking yourself the question, maybe you can just start Googling, where did this come from? You can start ringing up the manufacturer saying, how did you make this? You can start following up if every single person on the planet started to consider where it came from and where it's going and the impact of both of those and they start spending their money according to their conscious and what they're finding out. That is the change. It's not going to come from government. It's not going to come from big business. It's going to come from us, the consumers, because we demand. We, business is nothing without consumers. When we say this is what we want and this is what we'll pay for and this is not what we'll pay for, the world will change. That's right. The, I mean, the only way change is going to have from come from business is if government forces it or if consumers force it. So... And, and you can do that a couple of ways. One is by how you spend. The other is by giving constructive feedback to companies, not in – and uh, I, I'm a firm believer in not so much joining petitions, online petitions and everything. If there's an issue you care about, make a phone call to head mm. office, to the corporate office, 
or mm. write them a email that isn't a cut and post email. And mm. that has a huge effect because they think if you've taken the time to sit down and write, well, you, then you represent 10,000 consumers, you know, that, yeah. um, mm. whereas on, on a petition and an on, online petition, they almost discount them. You need it to be hundreds of thousands before they, uh, they, they take any notice, but. They've got to feel it at, at, at the ballot box, really. Well, the, well, that's how you, that's how you force government is that you you let people know why you are voting the way mm. the way you do. But I, I was really interested in, in in what you said at the start. It reinforces something that I say all the time: every decision you make is political, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. every choice you make is political. Every and and if you bear that in mind when you are shopping, you you make much better choices because you're actively involved in every purchasing decision you make rather than just sleepwalking your way through the supermarket, which is what I think we uh, we all do. So let let me let me go back to that point I was raising. Where do you think the easy gets are? Is it in? things like packaging or is it in it is it more in things like supply chain or is it in the actual manufacturing processes where do you think of an economy like uh, or um yeah economy of society like ours can easily make a difference quickly without relying on on the government passing new laws within the next 10 years I guess my, my, my the biggest on my wish list would be uh, at design school at universities, if sustainable um, if, if um, circular economy was the basis of all design, of everything that gets made, then there would be no more waste. And so, not only does that stop that polluting, it also brings ninety percent of all the investment in making stuff back into the economy. We're currently dumping around 90% of the value of the things that we make. Imagine how much more money is going to be floating around in the economy where we're not throwing it away, when we keep it in the economy. So, and for an economy like ours, and and, and America is is a a great example of this, that their, their economic wellbeing is de- is reliant on growth. The economy needs to grow. So, um, if you are preserving the value of the resources mm. that are in all of your manufactured product, well, then there's uh, there's so much more opportunity to grow in other areas, so that there can be social spending. You know, you can build social housing. Yeah. You can refit schools hospitals or whatever that might be using old For a fraction of the to price. heat and cool that's right there's yeah, actually yeah, money yeah. available yeah. to yeah. do these things so have you watched uh, the story of stuff i haven't not not that i can recall but definitely get everybody every single person on this planet needs to watch the story of stuff to understand what happened i think it was 1957 a couple of guys got really smart and they realised there was a lot of money to be made by making things redundant. And off they went. And they did a yeah, great job of it. That, that's something I don't think a lot of people actually understand, that that products breaking and needing to be replaced is actually part of our the, the model that our manufacturing economy um, functions on. And it's really... It's really quite depressing when you go through the supermarket or any or any kind of um, business, you know, whether you're buying power tools or or anything else, how they mm. are still manufactured. And I bang on about this all the time. You know, I, I did I did some subjects in 1983 about you know, environmental studies and and units on recycling and just. Design was part of the thing that we we were focusing on when I was at high school, mm. and nothing much has changed. I mean, mm. it, 
every time I buy something, I look at, you know, a gadget or a thing, you know, a screen or an electric toothbrush or anything like that that you think, mm. um, where, where did it come from and where can it go? When, when it eventually dies, what can I do? I mean, mm. I've got, I've got probably three or four big bags full of cables and plugs and just stuff, mm. old modems, old routers that I have to make a special trip to the other side of town and probably an appointment to get rid of it the, the, sustainably and, and how much mm. of it will be reused. We don't know. It's crazy that we are still living in, in, uh, in a society that hasn't dealt with this. It's all, but, but it's all part of that growth model. And it's a, it's a, it's a model of growth on a finite world that's, bringing basically civilization to an end, probably starting 2030 when the Great Decline hits. Uh, the What's Club of Rome in 17, 1971 said, this is, or 72, said, this is where we're headed and we still are. That's right. What, so what, it's easy to blame governments. Uh, I, I prefer to point the fingers at whoever is sitting around the board tables of, hmm. of companies for because they're the people who can actually make a decision today to change something making stuff delivering stuff building stuff whatever mm. but um what why are we as individuals when we we really know this stuff don't we why are we still acting no. against our own interests? no don't you think we don't people know. know that recycling no. is a good you, thing? you and i know a lot of people a, a, a lot of people are so busy just raising kids, making money, making the dinner, making beds, just living their lives, and watching my kitchen rules. They don't really know and they don't really want to know. It's well, just all that, a bit too I hard. I think that's it. I think they don't want to know. I think they know. Mm. I, I, I don't let people off with this because <laughs> but, no, be, because they'll go, oh, we're too busy. We've got all this stuff mm. going on. Mm. But you don't mm. just walk into a car showroom and spend mm. 50 grand not having done any research, you just walk mm. in and go, red car, I'll have red car. That's just not how people do. operate. Yeah. No, no, no. They, they, they have usually have done some mm. background yeah. research. They don't go in and go, oh, um, uh, they'll go, MG, I like MG, mm. I know about MG. Or, you know, why do people buy mm. Lamborghinis instead of Commodores if they mm. have, in a perfect world, if they had the same money? It's because they know about all the things that are attached to either brand. But people mm. know. We just let them off. We don't criticize yeah. them. We don't. We don't point at them. We don't say you're yeah. a bad person. But we do if they burn. If if they've got their incinerator going in their backyard, right? Grant, I think it's more than people, though. Look, it's the system. So we, we've. It, the economic system started what about 500 years ago. You know, but the basis of what we have now, that the 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 you know the, the the growth, it's based on debt and inflation, debt and inflation, and that's what it's growth, and that's why we have to grow. We don't have to have that system, and we can't. That system will break down because you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet with growing population. It's just not going to work, and with biodiversity breaking down at the rate it is, so the entire system has to change, and. And if you think it's too hard for people, imagine trying to be governments working together to change the entire economic system. That is all yeah. too hard. It shouldn't be. And so sustainability, what I call sustainability, is the relationship between the environment, society and the economy. It is a relationship. And when you get that relationship right, you can have an enduring presence on this planet but we don't have that relationship right. To get that relationship right means an overhaul. It means steady state econ uh, economy. It means all sorts of things that are very difficult to implement. Because we are based, we have an economy based on fossil fuels, particularly oil. When we, it's very hard to move away from that. And especially when you've got politicians who are financially supported by the very people that are, Backing us into this corner, let's say. It, it's interesting, I mean, let, let, let's just be political for a minute, that in America they passed the landmark 
um, what do they call it? Inflation reduction bill that has a, a large part of it is climate action. But a large part of it is also handouts to fossil fuel companies. Because in, in, in Australia, I think, um, was it Friday? The, mm. the, uh, the, the provisions that allowed billionaires and their family companies to hide their structures mm. was stripped away, thankfully, mm. on, on yeah, Friday. Yeah, yeah. I saw so, that from Michael West. <clears throat> so mm. that, may, that may lead to some change of some of our largest corporate entities in Australia Perhaps. because they can't hide what they're doing any longer. The level of, um, of um, money, government money, public purse money, going into subsidised fossil fuels still today is absolutely criminal. If that amount of money went into just about anything else, the world would be in a much better place. But because of where the power lies in the world, it remains. Yeah, it's, uh, again, it's something I bang on about all the time. I mean, with the, you know, having, having prepared thousands and thousands of tax returns for companies, mm. uh, what can be what can be claimed with the uh, diesel fuel rebate and things like that, and what can't be claimed when you are trying to do environmental good works? Uh, <laughs> the the balance is just wrong, mm. and um, well, in in my view, it's wrong, and and we should have moved beyond that. Um, yeah, and again, instead uh, of transitioning to sustainable energy and sustainable. Uh, lifestyles and sustainable business operations. We're throwing billions of dollars into carbon capture mammoths, and Which, and, and, and there <laughs> is no there is no commercial uh, carbon catch, capture and storage plant anywhere in the world that operates uh, on its own without being or, or, or could or could possibly um, elevate. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, it, it can't be replicated. Yeah, that, 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 that's the thing so far. I mean, we've been talking about it in this country for 30 years. We've been talking about it in the US for about 50 years. No one's managed to do it. So why don't we just invest money in the stuff that we know works? You know, you don't, you don't need to reinvent anything to make something work. Now, we, we've skipped over a couple of words. And, and let's, let's say, how do you define sustainable? And, and and I'll I'll let you lead on to something else which I was learning about in the eighties, the triple bottom line. Let, let's sort of define those triple, two concepts. What is sustainable? Yeah, and in, yeah, and in today's terms, what's the triple bottom line for reporting for a a company or a financial entity? Okay, well, sustainable to me is 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 that relationship is is of uh, between the economy society and, um, and, and the environment. Now, the, the way to describe it, and this, this feeds into your triple bottom line thing, which I totally debunk. It's not a total triple at all. But anyway, it's um, imagine a large circle, and that large circle is the environment. And then inside that large circle is a smaller circle called society. And then inside that one is a, is a small circle called the economy. And that is the gradient of what matters because um, I've written an article about the tri triple bottom line that says if you've, it's like imagine a three-legged stool and three legs, one's called the environment, one's called society, and one's called economy. If you uh, take away the economy, you still have environment and society. If you take away society, well, economy's gone, but you still have the environment. You take away the environment, you've got nothing. So this triple bottom line is incorrect because it in indicates a kind of equal weighting for the three of them. And that's not the case. You've got to have the environment right to get society right to get an economy. So healthy environment leads to a healthy society, leads to a healthy economy. Because the economy purely is a conduit between everything that everything that you have eaten today, that you've put on your back, that you've sat in, everything has come from the environment. 
Nothing came from the economy. It doesn't make anything. The environment makes everything that gives us out that we need to sustain ourselves, whether it's need or want or desire. Most of it, whether it's other people, um, comes from the environment. So that conduit really is is just something that works. There's so many of us and we've got cities, etc. That's why we need that conduit because not everyone can grow their own food so or grow their own clothes so to speak you know there's there's no real but the the conduit of, of the economy makes all this civilization possible but because our front facing is the economy we think that's where it comes from that's why we place all this massive importance on the economy we've got to have money but we don't realize that all that money is doing is giving us access to a, an environment that's breaking down at a very rapid rate. This is how I describe it to people who really want to understand. If I'm a room full of LNP hard-ons, this is how I describe it. Imagine the planet is a thousand dollars in the bank, and you're getting ten percent interest on that thousand dollars. So every year you get to spend a hundred dollars. So the way the planet is right now, we've denuded about half of it. That $1,000, we have been spending $200 a year, and now we're down to $500. And because we've broken down the production capacity of that $500, we're not getting 10% anymore. We're not even getting $50 a week and a year anymore. Because we've broken down the biodiversity and the way the natural systems work, we're only getting 5%. So we're hardly getting anything out of it, but we're still spending 200 a year. What happens when you keep doing that? You go broke. And we are going broke. Yep. It's, uh, especially when we look at um, how much money we're having to put into ameliorating the problems that are associated with the breakdown of the environment and the increasing severity of uh, it, it, weather events and, and mm. uh, drought events and, and whatnot. No one ever seems to talk about how much it costs to support farmers to, uh, to maintain an income on land that is now marginal. Um, and, and, and I don't usually have a problem with maintaining people through a, a hard time like that. But repeating it for 20 or 30 years without any discussion about what else could we do with this, with this piece of land that is not damaging? How could we do something beneficial? Uh, would, would it be cheaper or would it be the same cost to actually, to, to actually do something good? But that's, a, yeah. again, a, ho a whole other uh, issue. But there is an answer. That regenerative farming is is the obvious answer to that, and there are lots of people doing it, and they're actually making more money because it's more productive, and it's um it, it's the way to go. But we're not going to do it. I think it was Graham Sait who said that if every single person on this planet composted, we would fix our carbon problem. Oh. It's um. But, so it's really 8 billion people working together to fix this and not just relying on everything else. And, and composting is one of the easiest things that people can do. And mm. uh, again, when I put my, my horticulture hat on, we can do so many beneficial things just by doing simple things like mulching correctly in all public spaces mm. and selecting better plants for large-scale yeah. uh urban and and public projects uh that there, there's a whole lot of things that that don't need to be big and that don't need to be difficult um grass <laughs> let's stop mowing grass let's just plant short grass yeah or let's let's stop um let's stop making for instance i live across the road from a park which is about 75 percent grass well it's got to be maintained and it's got to be watered or else it looks terrible and people um, complain. It would be much better if most of that space was actually taken up by water-wise shrubs and mulched mm. gardens mm. and still allowing mm. space for people to, to play. Um, but you would cut down so much of the issue. I mean, it's mowed 
what mm. every week. Um, yeah. You know, there's an input cost there. Um, We've been sold an image of what looks good. We like to see things this night and I don't know if it came from you. Tidy. Tidy is the worst word. It's the worst word yeah, there is. Yeah. I, I heard someone, a very good friend of mine was talking to you today about, well, I hope it's tidy. You know, and I'm like, oh, my God. And <laughs> no, no, tidy is the enemy of good. That's right. That's right. All right. Let, 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 let's find a ray of, uh, a ray of sunshine from, uh, from all the problems. I think we, I think we know, I think we all deep down know that we need to change. So tell us a good news story, even if you can't name them in, in particular, but tell us about a, a, a business or two that have made significant differences by being involved with the Green KPI platform. Um, I, Green KPI is um, it's it's early stage, and we've just got a handful of customers that we're working with at the moment. Um, I'm taking um, you know emails from people who want to be with us when we really you know, do get things going. I'm uh, I really want to get those charts right, so I'm just working with people to get that right. Um, there is a surveyor company that is one of our customers. And uh, they're based in Darwin, and um, and I was up there a while back, and I, I dropped in to see them, and and um, so this this a uh, um, you know a guy in a high vis shirt, a surveyor guy, you know, outdoors guy, he, he comes up and he says, "Oh, are you are you that green KPI lady?" And I went, yeah, and he said, oh, "I love green KPI." And I said, "Oh, that's good. Why is that?" And he said, "I don't have to leave my values at home anymore." Now that <laughs> that's beautiful. Now, that is that's that's a beautiful thing for him to say, but that highlights what I was saying before to you about everyone knows this stuff, right? But they can leave their values at home. They're allowed to. Everybody knows. Everybody knows you don't tip paint down the down well, the drain into it, the stormwater. In a business, but, it's a bit harder. But you get away with it. Well, the individuals, this is coming back to the empowering employees. What Green KPI does is it empowers employees to do those good things. They want to do it. Employees love sustainability. But as an individual employee, it's very difficult to implement. But when, when, it's, when the um, when management subscribes to Green KPI and those actions are start being are being delegated to people and people are doing them, everyone's then collectively doing this thing together as a team. And then it becomes implemented as the normal thing to do. And so they they now manage their waste in a really, really lovely way. So the the water bottles go to the local RSPCA as a donation and they do a heap of things with with that. The um they don't have much in the way of compost, so there wasn't much to do there. But their landfill waste has reduced. It's all recycling. They do a lot of spray paint. So all that spray paint now goes to the exact right place it needs to go because that took a while to work out where to put the, the line marking paint. Mm -hmm. um, there's, so, uh, you know, and, and they love it. Everyone's putting the right thing and taking the lids off and it's um, it, it, it uplifts the morale of the entire place. But when one person tries to do it, but I gotta say, there is one guy there who continually fills the jug for one cup of coffee. Oh. Cannot, cannot break that one. <laughs> That's a failure on my part. I cannot get the guy to not do that. Yeah, yeah. Look, individual power usage is, <laughs> excuse me, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's... It, it, it is a really difficult one. I mean. Um, mm. You know, and not having a dry, a, a dryer is a is an obvious choice that people can make. But yeah, yeah, uh, that that I, idea of feeling good when you make those small choices, like when you, um, well, something I, I've recounted a few times is, uh, I, I share a house with with another guy, and we. Um, we used to blue all the time about what he was purchasing and how he was purchasing, and and I was contributing because I was buying um, soft drink, and just by the two of us making a few choices, we now never fill the recycling bin each fortnight. It might take 
six or eight weeks for it to get anywhere near full. Um, mm. It It's not difficult to – well, it's not difficult to make personal choices to reduce your consumption like that, but it is still difficult to make choices to eradicate the bad stuff because it's not being sold. Uh, the, the better alternatives are not being sold to us. And – I still cry sometimes or cry inside. I die inside when I've had to buy something in a, in a can with a spray thing, because I know when it goes into the recycling, Mm. it's probably not going to be recycled. So, so does that mean that local government is, is a target for you? Because oh, definitely. Because one mm. of our biggest problems is the fact that we all think we're recycling, but we're actually recycling a minuscule amount of what goes into our recycling bins. Yeah, I'm very careful to agree with that because it's very, very easy to plant the idea in people's mind that recycling isn't happening, and so then they don't. So, uh, and that's well, not I'm, the I'm, case. But, it, but I'm not. I'm not saying that. But yeah, uh, yeah, we, I know. I know. Just being think very that what careful. What goes in our recycling yeah. bin gets recycled. Yeah. Uh, again, I've only analysed closely five mm. different mm. councils, but mm. of those five, four of them are still warehousing stuff and it's still catching fire and causing massive uh, problems. Mm. So, And so, you know that why that is, don't you? Well, it's kind of complex. It's everyone mm. wants a rate cut. Mm. No one wants their rates to go up and it costs money to treat waste, be it recycled waste or throw away waste that can't be recycled, mm, mm. costs a lot of money. And very few councils uh, but don't you investing think, on what's required. Well, 10 years ago, couldn't we see China get, or, or even us coming to the point where we, that we could recognise this waste as 30, a resource? 30 years ago. 30, 30 years, years ago, ago. But let's... Well, years I did, ago. 30 years ago, I was saying that I would like to invest in the rubbish dumps because they will be the minds of the future. Mm. But So then even 10 years ago, couldn't we see that that resource was being wasted and therefore we could start that supply chain of harnessing that, that resource and then bringing it back into the economy? But the only reason that we have this warehousing problem now and things catching fire is China said, so we don't want your rubbish anymore. You deal with it yourself. Oh, and so the then suddenly we had this that. stockpile. Uh, I think one of Australia's richest companies has a business that relies on us continually producing new, new packaging, and and you mentioned before they donate to the political parties. They have huge influence on mm. what's been happening. We don't. We've been great. It's greenwashing, but we. I don't think people. Well, people didn't know that all of our recycling was being crushed in and palletized um you know turned into into compressed cubes mm. and then shipped off to china and then when china said no we we sent to malaysia now malaysia says no and we've got uh, instead of 20 years ago starting an industry where we could have reused recaptured all of that value Yep. Now it's waiting to set fire into tox- noxious, dangerous fires on the fringe of our suburbs, like where mm. I live. Um, and to give you an idea of how much waste we produce, you, are you aware of Overshoot Day, Earth Overshoot Day? Uh, no, fill me in on that. It's um, just You can Google it, Earth Overshoot Day. So we had that just, oh, it was a week or two ago for the planet. What it does is it's been worked out how much in the way of resource the planet produces in a year and how much is being used by us humans on a global basis. So there is an Earth Overshoot Day. We just got past it the other day. And every year it gets, it gets shorter because we're using more and more stuff. Australia, and every country gets its own Overshoot Day. Australia's overshoot day is March 23. So in less than three months, so than we, three use months we use a year's worth of stuff. If, if yeah. Australia was the world, we would need four planets. Yeah. And that's our rate of consumption and our rate of waste. Yeah. And, Nothing to and, be proud of. 
No, no, no. And and it's really easy to get caught up in in, in all the problems. But again, in Australia, we we fool ourselves that we're clean and green and <laughs> you know our our food is so healthy and everything. But we are we are probably worst or second worst per capita in terms of the wrecking the planet. We live lifestyles yeah. that we can't sustain. That's um, right. Again, a, a concept we hadn't talked about beforehand, but degrowth is degrowth a thing that we need to we need to do because I'm seeing that crop up a lot on social media now. How do yeah, you understand yeah. what, what what does degrowth mean? Oh, look, I don't think it's um. It, there's, um, it's not nailed down, but there's a degrowth movement that recognises that we cannot continue this economic growth on a finite planet. We have to um, change the whole way we do things. We have to start at the environment, say, okay, environment, what do you need? How can we work with you in order to sustain society? And thus the economy and so the idea is instead of working on this whole interest inflation model that we have that's purely economic get rid of that and go back basically to an indigenous way of looking at life and saying okay the, the planet that the, the environment is what sustains us you have to start with that first understanding and then when you have that understanding then okay how can we extract what it is that we need and then from that that we want and then from that what we desire without breaking systems and in fact there are ways of doing all of that you not only are you breaking we can start regenerating systems and that's what degrowth is basically about from my understanding is to create a system that is not based so when it says degrowth it's getting rid of economic growth as the main function of keeping society together because that is coming to an end. And, and if we don't have something to fall back to, if we just let it all fall apart, those dystopian movies will become quite real. And it's already happening in places. I'll tell you what the very biggest problem is that, that everyone is absolutely unaware of and it's number one and that's water. Oh. We are running out of water at the greatest rate. Just have to have a look at what's happening in, in some of the American states at the moment. And in and Australian. Um, yeah, yeah, and some parts of South America. And, I mean, we're, we're kind of used to drought as a concept in Australia and, and whatnot, but there are, there are parts of Europe that are running out of water. And, um, well, again, it's not a new concept. People have been talking about water wars and whatnot for a long time, but that's probably going to become a thing. Definitely. Uh, but it, it's just not that difficult to make small changes in your life to make a big, uh, a big impact. Um, oh. How hard is it, hard is, it is, is to be efficient with water? It really is just a mindset. It's an understanding of the problem. But if you don't understand the problem, then you don't think about managing it. And so I guess if you want to talk about government, the government could be doing a lot more when it comes to communication. But we when you imagine... We've made a rod for our own back, though. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, you you haven't lived in 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 Melbourne, I'm guessing, but we've had, you know, dry summers and water restrictions and whatnot for the whole time that 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 I've been alive. And each time when we do the water wise campaigns and don't be a wally with water and mm. all the ads about if you're going to wash your boat or your car, drive them onto your lawn to do your washing and all that. Right, so we've had all those campaigns, but what? But they've been episodic. Mm. We've got mm. drought. Let's be wise with water. It's rained. The dams are filling up again. Water panic over, and everyone goes mm. back to being profligate and 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 terrible. Mm. The smart move would have been to be continually pushing that message. Um, some. Some companies still do, and some, you know, we've got the graphs on the back of our. Uh, there, there's a good bird call. Uh, we've got the graphs on the back of our water bills and and, and our power mm. bills and all those kind of things that are meant to help us. But 
but we're not being continually educated and further educated week after week, month after month, and we're not being told where what the ga- what the gains are and what we. That, that's what you're, you're talking about surface water. Groundwater oh, I'm, is I'm, the big. Well, yeah. gra- groundwater, groundwater as well. I mean, uh, mm. obviously, in different parts of the country, groundwater has has um, uh, a, a different importance. But again, in terms of food production, mm. you know, yep. a, a lot of the places where we think it's reliable to grow food, well, they're running out of their groundwater. I, I know places where we used to get water at, uh, from bores in the ground, but now the bores, the bores have to be so deep that normal sort of... Uh, regularly available commercial pumps can no longer draw the water from that. That's bar. right. So you have to go into massive industrial pumps. So your $500 pump is now a $10,000 pump for you to be able to yep. get your, your drinking that head. water. You know, yep. that, that, that's right. So I, I, yeah. um, so well, the problem kind of is there's, there's a couple of problems with the water cycle. So one of them is that at 1.2 degrees, warmer atmosphere we're holding up towards around about nine going on to ten percent more moisture in the atmosphere in the air that's right. so that's right so it's just sitting there and it's so that means it's longer between rains and then when it does rain it comes Heavy down up. in these yep. massive flash flooding events and it runs off and it's not a chance so now the the soil is dry and hard and it's really hard for it to get back into the soil it just runs off and we've got so much in the way of cities and hard just runs off doesn't get a chance to regenerate the underground systems but also at the same time with mining and agriculture we're sucking it out at such a great rate we're great sucking it out much faster than what it can get back in and, and so, also re- re- recharge isn't something that happens in in one year ten year five that's years right. it happens over Some hundreds ten thousand. of thousands of years that's Some, right. yep 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 so uh, again we we've let We've dropped the ball on all these kind of things where they maybe it's just people my age were getting this information at school and then at uni and it was being talked about. I don't know if kids these days know about the recharge, oh, water recharge uh, I, and whatnot. Maybe not the water, but they're very much aware of, of uh, where we're headed, you know, like. Um, oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. But I. I, I guess I'm sometimes guilty of judging everyone by what I know and what I mm. was taught. Um, I, but I'd still be surprised if people who are 10 and 15 years younger than me didn't learn the same kind of stuff that uh, that I did unless they just weren't paying attention. But how, how do you... How do you think we can do anything quickly the, in in terms of, uh, I, I just saw a news article before we came on. Actually, I don't know if you would have had have caught up with this one, but the new senator David Pocock has said for his to get his support on the environmental laws that are being redrawn, uh, forestry credits are out. So forestry offset credits are out. So that so that to me seems to be something positive so that you don't get um, you don't get a pat on the back for maintaining a exploitative industry that is based on timber it means timber has to stand and continue to stand to get yeah. an offset which seems like a really smart move um, someone who's uh, really highly educated in the field of offset it described to me once I was at a climate um, seminar of some sort and went for days and i got to speak to i think it was somebody done one anyway it was um he said the offsets is absolute rubbish the only way offsets can work is when we get back to the same tree coverage before industrialization and then you can start using that maths but the maths doesn't work unless we get back to the pre-industrial co2 levels 280 if once we get back that and we've got all the trees, then we can start talking about offsets. But until right, we get that, to that restart point, it's mathematically incorrect. And yeah, all well, it is now well, is a financial instrument. That's right. And, and, and the idea that it's a credit 
if it's a credit, that means you have to be putting onto the plus side, which is where you need to get back to that tree cover, vegetation cover. I don't want to just call it trees. It's vegetation as well mm, um, mm. to, to and that oceans. point. And then when we get to the plus one, that's when you, that's when you get a, get a credit, but it's also a, a mechanism to continue the colonial mentality in that you are saying to countries that are on the, on the verge of industrialization, we're saying, no, 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 don't industrialize. We'll pay you to not develop your land the way that we have. We will pay you to stay there. Just stay down, stay back there. And that's, it's lazy, it's, it's exploitative, and it's basically, it's unethical, I think, the model mm. that we are relying on. I agree. I agree. Yeah. There is only one area of offsets that I know does work to some extent. Not so, not a single bit for CO two, uh, but for um, there's a number of places. A good example is in far, in uh, the Northern Territory. The um, the uh, fire workshops with the indigenous, or not just workshops, but the um, the back burning with the you know, traditional burning that the indigenous people carry out. That does um, the money that they make by doing that because that does have a, re a carbon reduction associated with it. It's, it's um, but it's not going to be enough to to you know fix the world. But the flow on of that is the social impact. It's being able to provide payment for rangers to actually work on their own land, which is a bit wrong anyway. Um, but you know the, this country was never ceded, and so the indigenous people, though, being able to live on country and uh, we are subject to this economic system still to be able to make money, to live on the country and look after their own land. That is a positive, uh, but it's one of the very few positives that I've seen. Um, so payment for ecosystem services is is quite a good scheme. And when that comes out of some of this uh, you know, trading schmozzle, um, then that's what I see as a positive outcome. But don't be banking your um, emissions on offsets. No, no, no. That's that. That there's not enough. Uh, there just isn't enough. I, I'm always amazed that we will pay agricultural entities, put it that way, money, money, money for failing. So uh, drought. I mean, droughts aren't new. So we uh, uh, aren't all businesses supposed to put money aside for a for a rainy day. Droughts aren't new, but but we're always putting money into uh, supporting entities that can't make money consistently off bits of land. So why don't we resume those lands back to the public estate and allow them to regenerate? And then if there's any money to be spent, let's control feral pests and weeds. So that we actually yeah. are rehabilitating the environment, but oh no, there's never any money for that. <laughs> well, there are. Um, I know up where I am that um, we have. Um, oh, the name's just gone out of my head. It's um, the transition officers, but there are people who are trained, uh, maybe not so much in a regenerative training, which is what I'd love to see, but being able to bring those better farming practices to farmers, so bridging the gap between research and practicalities on the farm and so the more of that that we have where farmers are supported in their transition to regenerative farming then people that aren't making a go of it now can make a go of it so they can stay on their land what happens is farmers are so poorly paid for their produce they take all the risk farmers they work massive hours they take all the risk of what can go wrong and then when it does go wrong they don't have you know, that their finances are really stretched. And when they don't have the finances, it's very difficult to do the right thing by your farm. You'll take the shortcuts because basically you have no choice. You know, it's like people eating, you know, uh, minute noodles when they're down on their weekly budget. Well, the farmer has that same situation where they might want to do all these things with the farm that they know perhaps they can do, but they can't, they just don't have the money. So if we invested in assisting farmers to transition to regenerative farming, that has everything good going for it. Controversial statement, Joanna, but uh, I don't think uh, a farmer is any more special than a pizza shop around the corner or a news agent. Uh, 
Oh and well, they don't. They the farmers live on the farm. The farmers, it's yeah, part but, of their home. But, that, but but that's land they have the excu- exclusive use to, and all that kind of stuff. I uh, I I don't know why. When uh, unless we ascribe a whole lot of other social responsibilities to people who are managing the land, that land, mm, um, mm. I don't understand why we continue to treat them differently in a whole lot of financial senses than any other small business why why are they any any different to a builder a property developer uh, a, a, a cleaning contract company a car dealership or a news agent or a pizza shop because we all need to eat yeah so we all so, need to eat and so farmers so we, have a so, special so place because they grow food no no but but we but we protect them Right in in, mm. in that, um, if you if you go broke as a farmer, all right, someone else will come and run your farm. It's the mm. land hasn't disappeared, right? That it's it it's no different than having a shop. And if you fail and move out, someone else moves in and does something else in the shop. That's the mm. that that's only the. That's the point. I yeah, I, I understand know. what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. I yeah. mean, we, 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 we romanticise, oh, my family's been here for five years. I don't care. Oh, for, fifth, for five generations, yeah. How many generations ago were you poisoning water holes and stealing the land? <laughs> yeah. um, it's just, to me, to me there's just no, there, there is no reason that we accommodate those businesses any differently than we would accommodate any other businesses. We've all got to eat, so therefore, you know, Nabisco is an important industry. Kellogg's, mm. Master Foods, you know. It, yeah, they're processing it. You've got to start with, yeah, it, yeah, with, the, with the produce in the first place. There's always going to be someone, if there's money to be made out of it, there's always going to be mm. someone who will do it. You know, I guess that's, that's the point. Food has turned into a, you know, a money-making a thing rather yeah. than a, yeah, well, that's exactly right. So and there's so many things that have become commodities that really – that that's that's the problem we're trying to get the most out of something to put it on the shelf rather than the nutritional value and the you know this is the social value it's the economic value if we can start applying some more social value back to these what we call commodities then you know we'll all be or would be in a better place if we hadn't transitioned to just purely economic value it- is someone actually cutting timber there, or was? Is it yeah, so there? I'm. It's 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 a. Um, I'm not far from um, a, a workshop. Yeah. I was going to say, is, 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 have you got a lawyer bird there that's making? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Making I think they've held off for as long as they could, but they, no, they no, no. It, 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 it's fine. We can still hear. All right. Let, um, so, who who's the ideal business that? to get involved with Green KPI now to help you develop the platform? What what are your mm. targets? Who, who are your targets? Yeah, um, look, I think businesses that, that um, uh, have high bills when it comes to energy, water and waste, uh, with a lot of things that can uh, assist them with, with that. Um, and I guess the, the, that often is the, um, the hospitality industry. Uh, and certainly with COVID, they got hit fairly hard. So the only they couldn't uh, generate more money. They could only save money by uh, reducing their costs by being more efficient with their energy use and um, water, etc. Um, but really, anyone in business, if you're spending money, um, you can look at what you're spending it on. Not just in terms of improving efficiency, but also improving your, uh, your both your uh, um, your environmental impact and your social impact, and they often go together. We often don't understand the supply chains that are attached to what we buy. So uh, that's what we're heading towards eventually is to have our circular economy really well done so when somebody has a waste, they can register that waste and somebody else who's searching for that product can then bring that into their supply chain. That's a ways off. But the great thing about even just that supplier um, section where you know, you might have an action. We might have an action about um, something as simple as uh, making sure that your air conditioning is maintained on a regular basis, because that really can make quite a difference to your energy bill. Uh, that will have a supplier there that um, that 
can do that for you. So you don't have to forget about it. It's right there. There's no excuse not to do it. What Green KPI is trying to do is to break down every single barrier to a business actually doing the actions, learning what to do and going and doing it. So there it is. There's the link. Engage the person and get those uh, actions delegated out to your team. The easier we make it, the more likely it is that it will be done and those impacts will reduce. So we don't really have a, um, a strong target market, but the areas that we've uh, identified that would be, uh, would really uh, benefit from Green Capo is the um, hospitality industry, getting a lot of inf- uh, interest from accountants um, because they want to be able to help their customers reduce cost. And also there's more and more and more people are interested in finding out about a company and their sustainability before they'll spend money with them. And so, uh, and it's not that easy to do a sustainability report. So if all you have to do is carry out your actions and and, uh, plug some information into a metric that shows how much electricity or fuel that you've used, there it is, it's done. Main thing is that you're showing people not just around the metrics, because everyone thinks that everyone wants to see the metrics. What everyone wants to see really is what you are doing. They want to see your action and that's, our main focus. We help you do the actions really easily and then we help you show the world what you're doing. So hopefully you've got a, a in terms of impact, a downward sloping graph over yes. time rather yes. than a flat one or an upward going up. one. So, mm. yeah, yeah, so- yeah. And then so with that supplier side of it, um, eventually let's say with Green KPI grows to be a global platform. And so then you've got a global set of buyers and suppliers. So you've, so to be a, a supplier on Green KPI, you have to be actually a customer of Green KPI. You have to be a subscriber. So that means that when, let's say, that we've got a builder who's buying uh, sunscreen for his, um, for his staff. So in the biodiversity section, it says purchase sunscreen that is biodiversity safe. Here's a link to somebody that can supply that. So when we develop our uh, our sustainability reports further that whole supply chain trans uh, transparency and traceability is built into the platform because people are buying and basically selling on the platform it just makes it really easy to track what people are doing up and down the supply chain is there is there a sustainable sunscreen that i can go and choose there are sunscreens that have a reduced impact on the environment, especially the Great Barrier Reef. Now, uh, I I usually make my selection. Um, I always buy the Cancer Council uh, one. Um, is is there a best choice if of a well known brand in the supermarket? And I and should I, I and, and, yeah. and should I be buying big? like one litre, five litre uh, sunscreens, is that more sustainable than buying something with all the right logos on the on the back in a tube? Yeah, li- large and refill is always much better. So, uh, you know, in a perfect world, uh, we won't be buying things in bottles. I haven't bought a bottle of soap or a bottle of shampoo for a very long time. Mm, I, I too, use so. bars. Yeah. It's, um, you know... The, uh, if I if I can avoid buying a bottle or a packet, like if I'm buying food, I'm not going to buy one in a in a box or in a plastic bag. You know they've got bananas wrapped in plastic. Why would you do oh. that? It, and then and then people cucumbers get cucumbers is the one that freaks me out. The, in, and you know what people do at the supermarket? Cucumbers in their own condom. It's just I don't I don't get it. And then those people will take those condomed cucumbers and put them in another plastic bag to yeah. take to the checkout. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Uh, I mean, this is anecdotal, but we used to get the shopping bags blowing down my street all the time. And I live across the road from a park, so a lot of people sort of dump rubbish there and whatnot. But since our plastic, uh, our single use um, plastic bags at the supermarket have been phased out, and that if you want one, you have to pay for it, mm. that rubbish that used to be tumbling those bags tumbling down our street every windy day gone so mm, so true. i i think there are 
impacts that can be made quickly. Um, don't buy stuff wrapped in polystyrene. Or and don't use polystyrene. the little bags. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, um, I, I, I just tumble it all onto the conveyor belt if I'm using a large shop, you know, I just or put it all oh, yeah, on the shelf, yeah, yeah. you know. But, it doesn't matter but, that it's not in a bag. That's right. And, yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's not hard no to one's make ever a complained. difference with... It's not hard to make a difference with the with the packaging. There's no. It's a mindset. Uh, no doubt about that. Um, mm. the, I, I always wondered, Joanna, and, and and I don't know whether whether your mind always goes here too, but I always think of the the whole supply chain issues that are hidden from us about how many how many um, actual entities are responsible for a product along the way, and there's a bit of profit put into everyone. Therefore, there's some uh, fuel inputs. There's some uh, some packaging inputs. There's some financing that might be in a in a bad finance business. All the way along the chain. Uh, so it would be great if they were more visible to us, so that you could make yes. a choice to you know farmers markets and all that is. They're good, but, you know, there isn't one near me, right? So uh, we do have a market. It's called a market, but it's essentially, uh, uh, it's essentially the, the, fruit, the fruit section of the, of the supermarket um, mm. in, a, in, a different, in a different building. But I don't know whether I'm buying my beetroots from someone who has bought them from an agent who has bought them from a distributor who has bought them from uh, a, a bigger distributor and it's really seven steps back to the farmer. You know, yeah, it's, that's the it, problem. The farmer takes all the risk and gets the least amount of money. That's right. And, uh, and it would be great if we, could, if we could see what all those steps are. It would. How far are it we, would. do you think, from those kind of... Um, uh, processes that kind of information being made available to consumers. Technology is the answer there. There's a lot of farmers who are now using technology to sell direct, and it's not that hard to do. It's just a matter of, of just getting it done. So that is happening more and more, and um, and I guess then all you've got left left over is um, farmers selling to the um, uh, the supermarkets. Um, and then, of course, the markets themselves, you know, the big markets where then it gets distributed. Um, I, I think it, that's a problem that is being addressed with technology and also consumer awareness. Cool. Well, I've got greenkpi.com.au up, up on the screen. I would encourage you to jump on and you can click for a free trial and and that gets you in touch with is it with you joanna or with the team yes no no with me it's um i uh, i have had a team to get me to this point um but uh you know it's the it's a sad founder journey where i am a non-tech founder of a technical company and um and so that has that's caused a few hiccups so now i'm becoming a technical founder of a technical company so um it's it's all up and running it's 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 fine it's just this metrics section that i want to get completely right and uh so that's what i'm working on at the moment but the actions are all available uh, the the metrics are available the graphs are it's all there it's just not as perfect as i'd like it to be Okay. But get those actions done. That's what matters. That's right. And the, and look, there's lots of sciencey people and uh, biodiversity kind of people who are in the bird emergency uh, audience. So maybe there's some with some skills who can reach out to maybe assist you as well, which would be that would be terrific. Which would be great. As I said to you when when I first reached out, it doesn't sound like it's right in the 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 wheelhouse of the bird emergency, but it absolutely is because we're not going to benefit birds unless we benefit the environment and maintain and improve biodiversity and stop using crap. If we, so it's all, it's all lumped in together. 
and we've got to help each other out. So It helps yeah. people to start thinking sustainability. You know, like when you first learn to drive a car, you're thinking about it. But when you, once you get into sustainability, it becomes second nature. Every time you go to buy something or make a decision, you're throwing that sustainability lens over it, that filter. And that just becomes normal. And then you do it at work. And then I've had people that I've uh, consulted for and I go back and follow up and they say, oh, we're doing all of that at home now. So it's just, it's a matter of just getting those thought processes bedded in. I'm just waiting for when I can buy my legumes and things loose, you know, in a big dispenser mm. like, like mm. they do with nuts and then mm. I can buy my, my lentils and my chickpeas. Take there are some stores you can there. do that. Yeah. Not around, yeah. not around my not where my you area. are. No, mm. no, no. Yeah. So, <laughs> and but the more we, we have, have of the, that, the better. That's right, and this is where we have to make the compromises. I live in a part of town yeah. where this kind yeah. of stuff doesn't happen. Now, mm. I'm not going to make a three hour round trip to mm. go and buy my my lentils that way. Right, I'm going mm. to buy them in the bag and then take the bag back to the soft plastic recycling thing. Even if mm. I am skeptical that they're going to actually recycle it, but at least if the supermarket knows that that thing is getting filled up every second day, that people want to use it, and then that's a signal that we need to do more. So sometimes the signal is almost as important as doing the. Uh, yeah, there's two ways right. around that. One one is to approach the supermarket and and say, listen, you know, like talk to a few people, put a put a notice around and say, listen, this is really what we want. And then when the supermarket discovers, yes, this is what we really want, they can trial it. It won't cost them a lot of money. And if that doesn't work, a lot of the area places that I've been to where I buy my things in bulk, you know, bags and bowls and, and bottles, is um, a, a community run. So if there's enough people, like-minded people, you can always just do it as, as a group. It's, 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 it's doable, but it's just not easy. It's much easier if you can get the supermarket to do it. And I was surprised at my local supermarket i'd been away for i came back and there were all these help yourself tubes so i was you know it's it's happening that's very good it, it, i'm guessing you've got a local iga there um i um there's a that i'm not too far from woolworths and coles and there's a local spa a little bit closer um, I'm about to move. I'm leaving my beautiful rainforest after 21 years. Thank you very much, Green KPI. It's um, I have put. It's literally cost me the farm. So um, I'm moving. That, that's what being in business is all about, isn't it? Taking that's right. Risk. That's right. Well, I'm now moving from my beautiful hundred acres in the rainforest to uh, a little acre plot um, up in the Tablelands, and I will love it. I've got 50 fruit trees ready to go in straight away. So. Um, It'll be fine, and watch those birds come. Oh, that's that's for sure. Well, um, I I hope we'll be talking again in the reasonably near future and catching up on how Green KPI is going. Um, I'll be, but please uh, do, uh, everyone, just send me an email. I'm at uh, Joanna. Um, uh, it's J O H A N A at greenkpi.com.au. And um, if you just want to be on the email list for when we get up and running as much as I, you know, that, that perfection thing, um, hop on the list. And as soon as it's um, in the right place, or if you'd like to be one of our founding customers, uh, we have a few, that can, and they're there because they want to use it and they want to support Green KPI. So if you want to come on board, you're absolutely welcome. So I'll put all the links that I can. And there's some really uh, interesting articles that. Uh, Joanna's written on the uh, on the site, so it's worth just poking around. So that's it there, greenkpi.com.au. Um, and Joanna, I hope we talk about your setting up your nursery in the future. We'll, we'll <laughs> I'm looking a, forward to it. Talk, talk a bit about mm. um, uh, plants mm. and maybe we'll talk about some of the amazing... Uh, 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 let, let me ask, Have you? Been, do you keep a bird list where you are now? No, no, I'm, I'm not a birder. Uh, there's so many and I know the sounds and I just, I record them because when I'm not home, I play them just to make me happy. <laughs> oh, well, there's, there's something to talk about and maybe, maybe we could use some of your recordings Audio. To, construct, oh, yes. to construct a bird list from, yeah. from the farm and then we can compare uh, it to what you, get, what you find when you move uh, up into the uh, tablelands. 
the the mm. dawn the dawn bird song it goes for about 10 or 15 minutes it is just the most beautiful orchestra you could possibly want to hear it's just so uplifting it's it's moving i love it we well, do have some um audio bird nerd uh fans in the in the audience so <laughs> good that might, good that might be that might be a fun project i'd be really mm. interested in in mm. first heard first seen and heard at uh at joanna's place uh, mm. great all right. Good. All right. Well, Joanne, thank you for the chat. Thank you for joining me, um, everybody. GreenKPI.com.au. Uh, check out the good work that Joanna's doing. Like we say, we've got to pump up our allies and listen to listen to what's going on at her place. Uh, pump up our allies and support them in every way we can. Thanks, Joanna. Bye.